Hey guys, now today's video is a bit novel insofar as it is just after four o'clock in the afternoon and there's actually a bit of natural light coming through my window for the first time in like six months. So uh, I think springtime might be finally on the way. So today we're going to be having a look at a bit of ill-fated Commodore history and a machine that many people have kind of forgotten in this day and age. Uh, a machine that was really one of Commodore's biggest flops, if I'm honest. However, I've always had a bit of a, a soft spot for this machine. We're going to be having a look at the Commodore 16. Now, the reason I've always had a bit of an affinity for the 16 is it was the sister product to my first ever home computer, which was this bad boy here, the Commodore Plus 4. Now, I've done a separate video on the Plus 4 about two or three years ago, if you're interested. Um, I'll pop a link to it in the video description. However, the Commodore 16 and the Plus 4 were uh, kind of perfect examples of what happens when sales, marketing, accountants, and uh, those kind of guys, the guys in suits, get on the committee of designing personal computers. So uh, this actually does have some similarities with another machine that Commodore released in the early 90s, kind of proved that Commodore didn't really learn from their history, and that is the Amiga 600, which actually even looks a bit like a Commodore Plus 4, you know, design-wise, it looks very similar. And I did um, an interview on my channel with David Pleasance last year. Now, David was the uh, final managing director of Commodore here in the UK, and he was talking to us about the Amiga 600 and told us that originally it was supposed to be a cut-down version of the Amiga 500 and was meant to sell for £199 to compete with, like, the Sega Mega Drive. By the time it had gone through all the, uh, you know, sales and marketing departments and all that, it actually ended up costing £400. It cost more to make than the Amiga 500 and had stuff like... Uh, a hard disk interface and PCM CIA adapters and all that kind of stuff in, completely missing the point of the original aims of the project. Now the Commodore 16 was very similar actually. Now this was, I believe it was Jack Tramiel's last project at Commodore, he definitely started it before he left. And the purpose of the, the 264 range, as it was called in the end, was that here in the UK, Commodore were doing very well with the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. However, their main competitor was the Sinclair Spectrum. Now, obviously, Commodore always aimed to sell, you know, cheap machines, you know, computers for the masses, not the classes, as Ed Jack always used to say. However, here in the UK, you could buy a Sinclair Spectrum, usually for about 100 quid cheaper than, than a Commodore 64. So what they decided they needed is a really low-cost machine that they could release, um, a machine that kind of came underneath the Commodore 64, a replacement for the VIC-20, that they could sell for like 199 and would be perfect for like kids to learn programming and that kind of thing. And originally it was meant to be uh, the Commodore 116. That was a machine that it turned into in the end anyway. So it had a chiclet keyboard, uh, 16 kilobytes of memory, and it was meant to retail and be very, very cheap to make. And uh, like I said, you know, it could be sold at a, a rock bottom price to complete head on with the Spectrum. However, by the time it had gone through all the uh, different various departments at Commodore, in the end, what you had is three machines that were released, um, one of which actually cost the same as the Commodore 64, and that was a plus four I showed you a moment ago. Uh, by the end of the project, it had stuff like a word processor, spreadsheet, database built in, um, quite an advanced version of the basic uh, programming language. Although it had software, it, software wise, it was completely incompatible with the uh, Commodore 64. So selling at the same price, it meant that nobody wanted it. Why would you buy a plus four at the same price as a 64? And uh, the 16 was a bit of a, bizarre inclusion in the range. I think this actually came quite late on actually. As at one point in the project, these machines all use a chip that's called TED. Now uh, TED is meant to be a low cost all-in-one uh, processing unit. So on the Commodore 64 you had stuff like, you know, uh, the SID chip that did sound and you had you know, dedicated graphics chips and all that. In these machines you had one chip that took care of all that. It took care of everything from the inputs from the ports, um, to doing the sound generating, to doing the uh, the graphics, and it meant that these machines were cheaper to manufacture internally. However, um, their capabilities were a lot less in terms of graphics and sound than the Commodore 64 was. It had no um, hardware sprites, for example. The sound capabilities were nowhere near the quality of the, of the uh, SID chip on the C64. And at one point in this project, they had three machines, and there was going to be the Commodore 232, uh, that had 32K, the 264, these both look like the plus four. And there's also meant to be a high-end one called the Commodore 
364. And this was going to be kind of a, a large Commodore Plus 4 with a numeric keypad and stuff like a, a built-in speech synthesizer that was based on the Magic Voice uh, cartridge. So, you know, this project was all over the place, really. Now, uh, this machine here is essentially a uh, cut-down Commodore Plus 4. So it's a Plus 4, but with only 16 kilobytes of memory and uh, none of the built-in word processor software and everything. However, this machine is quite uh, probably the most popular of the range because it looks like a black Commodore 64 or VIC-20, really. It comes in that, you know, famous Commodore bread box or bread bin case, whatever you want to call it. And it's actually found quite a few fans in the modding community. I've seen guys on forums who actually transplant Commodore 64s into the Commodore 16 case. So you can have this kind of charcoal casing and this grey keyboard because it looks, you know, quite funky, really. So what I'll do is I'll give you an overview of the Commodore 16. And, you know, as someone who grew up with a Commodore Plus 4 and is very familiar with the software on this platform, I think it has got a few kind of neat features. And also there are some, you know, undiscovered gems that you might be interested in seeing, some kind of games that were actually quite good on this platform. There was a lot of crap as well, don't get me wrong. So what I'll do first of all is we'll give you a little hardware overview. Uh, I'll show you a few of the peripherals I've got for this machine, and then we'll have a little look at the software available on the Commodore 16. And here we have it then, the Commodore 16. Now, as I showed you a moment ago, the case and design of this machine is very similar to the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20 using this uh, bread bin or bread box casing design, whatever you prefer to call it. However, I have always thought that the Commodore 16 does look a bit cooler than the Commodore 64 and the VIC, uh, just because you've got this kind of charcoal black casing and uh, this grey keyboard. And also it means that whereas the older Commodore machines tend to uh, suffer with oxidization or going yellow, you know, the, uh, the bromine chemical that's in there, uh, being a darker colour, you generally don't get that problem with the Commodore 16, so that's definitely one bonus. And it just looks really stylish, I think, here, all in, you know, these dark colours. Uh, the keyboard is very similar to the, uh, the VIC and the 64, however, one thing I do really like about the keyboard on the 16 is the fact that the cursor keys are all separate here at the top. You know, on the older machines, it's basically two keys and you have to use shift to change between the directions. On here, they're all laid out in separate keys. So uh, it may means moving around basic with the cursor is a lot easier than it was on the 64 and the VIC. And also we have, uh, you know, the, the graphic commands on the front here, the Petsky graphics for using in basic on the key fronts. But also the version of basic that comes with the Commodore 16 is actually a lot better than version 2 that came with the 64. And that doing stuff like graphical commands is a lot easier. It's kind of a bit more like um, Simon's Basic, if you ever use that expansion cartridge on the Commodore 64. And rather than, you know, peeking and poking like you had to with the 64, doing stuff like uh, changing colours, as you can see on the front of the keys here, reverse text, uh, flashing text off and on. You actually get these shortcuts, you know, that you can access in Basic just by shift and then it inserts the commands. Uh, also, we have the function keys down the side here, like the older machines. Um, however, they kind of split up, so you've got two on each key. And there is a help key that got introduced on this machine as well. There's some programs used for, you know, documentation and, uh, well, help commands, obviously. Uh, you've got the shift lock key that sticks down like in the old, uh, all the old 8-bit machines that Commodore released. Now, if we look around the side of the C16, we've got a few interesting ports here. Now, the power supply is often the thing that breaks on the Commodore 16. The ones that the Commodore supplied were notoriously flaky. Uh, but however, it does mean it is really simple to use a replacement PSU as the port is very standard. And in fact, I think you can use a Spectrum Plus 2 power supply on here. Uh, and also, a Sega Mega Drive power supply works just fine. And that's actually what I use for my Commodore 16. So it works perfectly. It's actually the same voltage. So you can use a, a Mega Drive Sega Mega Drive PSU on this if you get one off eBay that doesn't come with one. Uh, we have the off and on switch here, same as the 64. This also has a reset switch on there too. Now, a lot of Commodore 64 users used to kind of hack in a DIY reset switch onto the cartridge port. However, with this machine, Commodore finally came to their senses and included one. However, any sense they did get, they did quickly lose when it comes to the joystick port design. Now, as you can see there, they're completely different to any other 8-bit machine of this era, rather than using the standard 9-pin uh, Atari adapters, they use these mini DIN ports. Now, electrically, I believe these are pretty much the same as standard joystick ports, and you can get, you know, or make your own adapters really simply to use normal joysticks on it. Uh, however, the reason they went with these mini DIN ports, apparently, is because the full-size joystick ports wouldn't fit on the casing of the Plus 4 and the uh, Commodore 116, so uh, you've got this kind of, you know, unique joystick port for this machine. There were a few third-party joysticks released for it. However, the one that most people had is uh, these Commodore ones, uh, which 
they did actually bring out a version of these uh, Commodore joysticks for the 64. They're not all, actually all that bad. I find these quite comfortable to use, but they are quite flimsy and do break quite easily. Uh, moving around the back of the Commodore 16, hopefully I can get it all in on camera there. Um, looking around it from uh, this side along, we've got a cartridge port here that's labeled memory expansion. They did bring out at one stage a uh, 64K RAM expansion that can plug into there. Most users used it for uh, cartridge games and also the uh, Commodore disk drive for this machine, the parallel one, uh, plugs directly into that port there. An RF modulator, uh, we've got video and serial. Now these are, quite fortunately, the same ports that you'll find on a Commodore 64 or a VIC, so that means video cables and, uh, you know, the 1541 floppy drive printers and also a bit more useful in this day and age the uh, SD2 IEC um, SD card interface will plug in and work with this machine as well and uh, next to it we have a cassette port which again uh, even though it would have fitted fine on this machine it is smaller than the one that you'll find on the uh, the VIC-20 or the Commodore 64 it is another mini DIN port there again adapters can be uh, made up or bought so you can use a standard one uh, nothing on this side of the casing and if you look on the bottom my machine actually still has its original warranty seal which uh, I am going to break right now as uh, I am going to open the machine and show you the internals quickly and I do want to do some mods on this anyway so it was going to have to be broken at some stage. I want to upgrade this to 64K internally and stuff. So we're going to crack the machine open and I'll show you quickly what it looks like inside. So I've got the Commodore 16 casing opened and the warranty seal has been defiled. I know there will be people that are like, no. However, if you do get hold of a Commodore 16 or a Plus 4, you really do have to open the case because there are a couple of things that you will absolutely need to do if you want to keep these machines running. And uh, judging by the uh, the look of the chips on here, there is one that was manufactured in um, October 1986 by the looks of it. So it's probably the first time this machine has been open in 30 years. And I'm quite surprised that it's still running, as that there are a couple of design flaws with these machines, um, mainly coming from these two chips here. Now, I'll quickly talk you through the, uh, the layout of the board. As you can see, this is actually the first time I've uh, had a Commodore 16 open. I can identify a few of the components from the Plus 4, but this board is actually really small. I mean, you've got all this room around, you know, this. if you look at a Commodore 64, it takes up the whole thing. You can actually see where the, the 64 would be screwed into this case, you know, the old mounting points there. So uh, this board could go in a lot smaller case and the uh, the bread bin design that we've got on this machine um, but looking around it then these are the two chips that are unique to the Commodore 16 and plus 4 and the two that are more likely to cause you any problems than anything else now this is the main IC that makes the Commodore 264 range what they are. This is the TED chip that I was talking about before. And this handles pretty much everything from a lot of the uh, control inputs of the machine, uh, the graphics and the audio as well. Uh, the problem is that the TED chip is particularly delicate. Now, you can even damage your TED chip by plugging in a joystick with an auto fire. And uh, turning the auto fire on is a pretty dead cert way to fry part of the, um, the TED chip internally. The thing about these machines is they can function with the chip partially damaged. So if you're gonna buy a Commodore 16 or a Plus 4, uh, make sure that everything works on it. For example, I've, I've heard of machines where the cassette port won't work, but everything else will, or maybe the joystick ports won't work properly anymore. However, you know, pretty much everything else will. So it can function with a partially damaged TED, so that's always worth checking. And that uh, these chips are notoriously uh, susceptible to overheating. Now, as you can see on uh, the top of it, there is some thermal paste that's been applied from the factory now. Obviously that was like 30 years ago. So I'm going to refresh the thermal paste on here. On the Commodore Plus 4, this is actually housed inside a little metal box. Uh, on here, though, um, you actually get an RF shielding that covers the entire board, and there is a little bit of that that comes down and uh, connects to this chip on the top here on the thermal paste. So basically it uses the RF shielding as a heat disperser, which is kind of a cool design and probably means, you know, with it being larger, heat's not so much as a, of a problem on the 16 as it is a Plus 4. However... The chip that most commonly fails actually is the CPU. Now this machine uh, uses the MOS 8501 or there's an earlier iteration of this called the 7501 and these are the chips that are most likely to fail in this machine. They're very very sensitive to static and also they are notoriously uh, susceptible to overheating as well. So if you ever get a Commodore 60 or a, or a Plus 4 and you turn it on and you just get a black screen that's because the CPU has died. So what I'd implore you to do is get the machine open ASAP and fit a heat sink to this. Now, I've on my Plus 4, I've actually got a uh, just one that sticks on. You know, you can get these kind of uh, attachable heat, sti heat sinks. Even those, you know, will give you a lot better cooling than uh, comes internally. 
there are some people that have got like cooling fans and all that fitted to it but my plus fours ran fine for years just with a little uh adhesive heat sink on the top of it so definitely worth doing that if you want to keep your 16 running a bit longer uh next to it trying to see what these chips are here i think these are um yeah that's the kernel there and that is a basic 3.5 on that chip that that i think is the pla um so that's basically you know does a lot of the uh kind of control and uh, memory allocation and that kind of thing. I'm not sure if that's actually compatible with the PLA on the uh, Commodore 64, although I did read there is a chip called the Super PLA uh, designed by individual computers. Uh, Gens actually makes one, and I think it is compatible with the 16 and the Plus 4 as well. Um, and then next to it there, uh, yes, yeah, just the keyboard input. We've got a bit of memory and stuff around here and the serial port controller. So, you know, it is quite a simple board, really. There's not, not really a lot to show you. It's a very, very tidy, compact design. So what we'll do now is uh, we'll get it back together. I've also got a few peripherals for this machine as well that are pretty cool. So I'll give you a quick example of those. And here are all of the various peripherals that I've got for the Commodore 16 and Plus 4. I've actually brought you down to my living room to give me a bit more room to lay them out on the floor here. Um, and as you can see, most of them are actually in their original boxes, including the Commodore 16 itself, which uh, if I move this over here, you can see it's actually got its uh, original box still. It's a European box. And this was... I'm going to give a shout to my buddy Marvin, who uh, actually supplied me with this machine in the last couple of weeks. This is my second Commodore 16. My first one actually ended up in the bin. I know, tragic, about 10 years ago. Uh, luckily, I've got my hands on another one in the last couple of weeks, hence doing this video. So uh, thank you, Marvin, for sorting me out with this lovely example of the Commodore 16. Now, I've also got some uh, other peripherals. We've got the uh, joysticks. I've got two of those, as I mentioned, so I'll move those out of the way. Uh, and also the... Um the data set. Now, this is my original one that I got with my Plus 4 back in uh, 1988, I think, when I got my Plus 4 for Christmas. Uh, still works perfectly well to this day. Uh, it comes in this kind of charcoal black as well, like all of the um, 16 and Plus 4 accessories do. Uh, even got the manual for it still there as well. And you could use these on a, a VIC-20 and a Commodore 64 with an adapter that was often sold with them if you bought them in the shop. Uh, plus four manual there. Uh, in here, even though it's incorrectly labeled Commodore 64 disk drive, this is actually a uh, Commodore 1551 floppy drive. And this only works on the Commodore 16 and plus four. So if I move these aside, uh, these are actually quite rare. I've done a video on uh, Commodore floppy disk drives before. Got my manual there with it too. And if I take this very gently out of the box here, um, still got its polystyrene onto. So I'll move this down, you can have a look at it. So it's got its head protector in there too. Um, which if I take out, there you go. And this is very similar uh, to the Commodore 1541 drive that you often used on the Commodore 64. However, this is a parallel drive that comes with this big uh, cartridge adapter. So what you do is you plug it directly into the cartridge port of the Commodore 16 and Plus 4. And actually this is a lot quicker than the Commodore 1541. It's about five times quicker actually. So I'll just quickly move that aside before I pack it all back up again or uh, fire it up to give you a demo. And here we have the Commodore MPS 803 printer. Now this, uh, I believe they did do a version of this for several Commodore machines. You can always tell if it's intended for the 16 and plus four by this kind of rainbow stripe along the top, which is the same as on the computer. So if I open this up quickly, and these all work, you know, they're on the original boxes and they're all really nice condition actually as well. I'm a bit of a, you know, collector for the, the Commodore 16 and plus four stuff. Um, the only thing I really need is a monitor. Commodore did make a uh, jet black monitor to go with these machines as well. So as you can see here, it's, uh, there we are. A very, very low quality um, nine pin dot matrix printer uh, that comes with you know the Commodore branding on everything as well. I think these were just kind of off the shelf printers that Commodore badged up. Um, but you know, it comes in this kind of black case to match the 16 and the plus four. Uh, you can use these on a Commodore uh, 64 and a VIC-20 as well as it uses the uh, standard Commodore serial cable. I think I've got in there somewhere. Oh, and an original cartridge there too, that no doubt dried up many years ago. So there you go, there's a few of the peripherals I've got for the machine. Uh, now let's get the Commodore 16 fired up finally and show you a bit of the software on there. 
So I've got my Commodore 16 set up on the table I normally have my Commodore 64. I thought since we'd unboxed the floppy disk drive, we'll keep it a bit old school and use actual floppies for this vid. And I've got it hooked up to a modern Samsung LCD screen. Uh, the reason is because I normally use a CRT for this as it looks a lot nicer, but filming a CRT, you get black lines and it looks flickery and everything. So we'll stick with the LCD for the purposes of this video. Now we're looking at the screen that you see when you first power on the Commodore 16. Um, it looks a bit lighter than the one that you get on a C64 and we're running in Commodore BASIC 3.5, we have 12.2 kilobytes available for basic programming, which, you know, is quite a lot considering it's only a 16K machine. And I've got a disk in the drive with a few games preloaded onto it. Now, the good thing about Commodore BASIC 3.5 is it actually has some inbuilt disk commands that are specifically for loading off disk, and they're even preset on shortcut keys. So if I press F3, that will give me a directory of the disk that's currently in the drive. And as you can see, I've got a few games I've already loaded on there. So if I want to load that Mr. Puniverse, that was always one of my favourites, I'll press F2. As you can see, you get deload. Um, and then we'll just type Mr. Um, dot, actually, that should do. Do a wildcard there. And now it will load the game uh, from the 1551 floppy disk drive into memory. Shouldn't take it very long. And the good thing about the uh, Commodore 16 and the Plus 4 is most of the games are single PRG files as opposed to entire disks. So, of course, they're quite small. They can actually fit quite a lot onto a, uh, a single side of a floppy disk. So we'll press run. Now, this is always one of my favourite games as a kid. I figure out how to start the game again. This was a follow up to a game that was called Big Mac. There we go. I've got the joystick hooked up. Now, I did watch uh, Steve Benway do a video on this, uh, and he, he messed up and didn't realise what to do. I think it does tell you in the manual, but yeah, who's got time to read them? Basically, you've got to collect all the vitamins on this game and uh, press a fire button to jump over these guns that shoot things at you. So, if we walk along here, they fall from under your feet, as you can see. Go down and get the vitamins. Oh, collision detection is pretty bad, luckily for me. <laughs> and we'll fall down here. I used to love this game as a kid, so get the vitamin there. And I think there was a port of the first game, Big Mac, on the Commodore 64, but this has always been my preferred version of it. And this game is called Spiky Harold. Now, uh, this was actually a pretty decent platform game. Uh, it had some pretty nice graphics as well for the platform. So it was one of my favourites when I was little, this game. Not the easiest to control in hindsight. Oh, and I'm dead. <laughs> However, graphically, I thought, you know, it was a very decent attempt for the Commodore 16. What if you can jump on the heads? Nope, you can't. <laughs> I said it's been about probably 25 years since I last played this game. I can't actually remember how you do this. I think you might have to... Yeah, that wasp just narrowly avoids you. As you can see for the first level, it's pretty brutal. So I think if you walk back there, then jump, then you've got to do it before the, the wasp gets over and avoid the bee or spider or whatever that is. There we go, screen two. Yeah, these wasps are pretty brutal actually, so you've got to kind of time it right. What's down there? Yeah, it was quite a colourful game. I thought the, the main character was drawn really well and for the limitations of this machine. Is it a wine glass we can collect? Yep. <laughs> Hedgehogs like wine, as we all know. Even an animation there when he eats that um, apple or whatever it was. So there you go, that is Spiky Harold. Now this next game is called Speed King and it was uh, one of my favourite racing games on the Commodore 16 and Plus 4. It was by a coder called uh, Sean Southern, who uh, actually used to do quite a lot of um, racing games on this platform and it was a pretty decent attempt really. Now the game actually yeah, it goes on its own, you just press up to control your gears. You can see I'm in a fifth gear now. Some nice explosion sound effects there. Back down to the first gear. And I think this was probably one of the first ever racing games I played as a kid. He did this in a game called a Formula One Simulator that were both very similar. Um, however, I've got to say, I think this was my favourite one. Oh, pretty hard to actually get by these guys. <laughs> I'm very out of practice. I always used to come first when I was a kid.
There we go. Coming back to me now. Now this game is called Phoenix and it was an arcade that I used to love when I was a kid and uh, actually when I got back off my holiday to Spain uh, when I was about maybe nine years old I had the arcade of this at the hotel and luckily uh, when I came back I found a copy of it for the Commodore Plus 4 and 16 in my local game shop so uh, it's quite cool to be able to play at home. It was um, a shoot 'em up game that was wasn't all that popular I don't think. It wasn't like you know classed up there with Gallagher or uh, Space Invaders but the port of the C16 was actually pretty decent. And you've got a shield, you press up. Then, you know, it doesn't matter if bullets hit you then. It's a very short game though, there's only about four screens in it. You start by clearing these guys and then, uh, I think you get some like birds and eggs before you get uh, an end of level boss. This guy in a giant UFO. So, yeah, it's actually a pretty good game. Wasn't, like I said, one of the most popular shooter maps, but it was always probably my, my favorite. Definitely on, uh, on this machine. If it wasn't um, Space 2, that was a good one as well which I might demo actually if I've got it on a disc. Now this game was one of my absolute favourites on this platform as a kid. Uh, another game actually written by Sean Southern who, uh, you know there were a few guys who really knew how to get the most out of the Commodore 16 and Plus 4. There was Udo, Udo Gertz was another guy as well. Uh, but Sean was a great coder and this was kind of a clone of that, uh, Mr. Do. Very good though. It's even got music going all the way through, that, uh, that Ted sound. <laughs> And I think you can actually drop the apples on their heads. Oh no, it falls in your head as well. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've played this. Let's see if I can get one on uh, someone's head. Now oh, they're all coming that way now. Wise to my skills. Oh, so on that one all you have to do is clear the strawberries. On some levels you have to kill all the enemies as well, I think. Now this game used to frighten the life out of me when I was a kid. This is called 3D Ghost Chase. I think there was, you know, various ports of or, or very similar games for other platforms. I think it originated on the Spectrum. Was it like 3D Glooper or something? But basically you get this uh, maze here and you get this kind of little Pac-Man style character. And on the uh, left side of the screen is a 3D view with a monster going around. Now the aim is to uh, eat all of the pills before the ghost gets to you. And as you'll see now, he'll come around the corner. <laughs> Yum. Yeah, he's dead. It really actually gets the adrenaline going when you get into this game, when you're down to your final few uh, little bits. And uh, there's actually some of the later levels where he's invisible. So um, definitely a game worth picking up this one. I thought I'd give you an example of a bigger multi-load game. Actually, this is a bit of an epic for the Commodore 16 and Plus 4. Winter Events is called by the legendary Udo Gertz, who was by far one of the most talented coders on this platform. It's quite a big game, so actually it loads each part of floppy disk, or if you get the tape version, it's a multi-loader on tape as well, which takes a long time. The music might sound familiar on the opening ceremony here, if you keep listening. Wait for it. <laughs> Dropping in the Dallas theme. So after that you get to choose which events you're going to take part in and also I think this supports up to four players this game so uh, yeah it is a pretty massive game by Commodore 16 standards so uh, I'm just trying to remember how to play this again. Put it down to one player. Um, so yeah if you compete in some events you can pick them. Now you can enter your name and your country, so I'll just press Dan, and then you can, I can't remember how you, it gives you your national anthem of your country when you, maybe you press return first. Did 
there is a way to change which country you are, and it gives you all the national anthems, but I can't remember how you do that now. So you can pick from here, you can do, um, let's just pick a few random ones. I remember uh, downhill was always fun. Um, ski jump was very hard. I'll try uh, biathlon, that was quite hard too. Speed skating. Bob sled, that was awesome. So yeah, just pick which events you want. Um, okay. Then it will load it off the disc. I picked the hardest one to do here. I remember this being impossible when I was little. <laughs> but graphically it was very nice. A lot quicker than cassette tape. And very good music as well for the Ted chip. Alright, how do we do this then? Oh, okay, you have to move around, get straightened up. No. <laughs> I did it upright. Probably first time in my life. That's me versus the computer in this one. Speed skating. I think this is a bit of a waggle the joystick affair. Is it? <laughs> no? I can't remember how you play this. Up and down. Yeah, I've got absolutely no idea how to control this one. However, you get the idea. So uh, that has been a few of my favourite Commodore 16 games. I mean, I could go on for hours. I could show you, like, you know, Tom Thumb and uh, Bridgehead, Treasure Island. Um, all of the classic games I used to play, but this video is going to be about two hours long. So we'll, uh, we'll cut the games there. So there you go, that's been an overview of the ill-fated Commodore 16. Uh, a machine that, like I said, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for this machine. And I do appreciate a lot of people have probably never seen one or never tried one. Is it worth buying one though? Um, well, to be fair, if you've got an interest in kind of, you know, quirky Commodore machines or maybe even unexplored 8-bit platforms from the mid-80s, there are some undiscovered kind of nuggets on the Commodore 16 that you might be interested in having a look at. And it has still got quite an active community, particularly in kind of Eastern Europe. And here in the UK, where these machines were quite popular in the late 80s for a while, as they're really trying to get rid of them for like, you know, I think my mum bought my Commodore Plus 4 for like £25 at one point. And they cost a bit more on eBay than they did 10 years ago, like, you know, most old machines. But you can still get a pretty good condition Commodore 16 with, uh, you know, the cassette uh, deck and the joystick and all that probably for about £40. So if you're interested in trying out a platform that you probably haven't seen before, and there are some, you know, kind of cool little things that you can look at, good demos and games, I'd recommend that you pick one up and just have a little play with it. So that's been my look at the Commodore 16. Any questions, of course, leave them in the video comments box. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.